so we're here on the farm and I don't know what you can and can't see. But we're putting sheathing up today. That's right, a, babe? That's the plan. <laughs> I'm gonna try my best to help. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm going to try something a little different here instead of just throwing the music up and that going along with the time lapse. I'll try to do a little narration along the way as we go. Obviously, we're at the point we're getting ready to start doing the roof sheathing here, doing half inch OSB sheathing. Got me and, uh, me and Amy up there, me and my wife Amy working on it up on the scaffolding. Uh, it's actually a pretty big accomplishment at this stage of the game that she's up on the scaffolding. We first started the barn build. I think I was lucky if she made it to the second rung of the ladder, maybe the third, I think it's pretty much the second rung of the ladder. So the fact she's going up the scaffolding is quite the accomplishment. Um, yeah, so it makes it easier. Definitely if you got two people throwing this up, I started a partial piece there at the beginning, only five foot. So we got a 30 foot length here. And then obviously as I go and I come up to the next row, I don't want my seams lining up and I want them to be offset. So I just ran some numbers and start with the five foot piece there and go at it that way. And this is our, this would be an animal barn, 30 foot long by 20 foot wide. It's going to have a man door in the first bay, kind of the most left bay that we're looking at the side of the barn throw a man door in there and a couple windows going down the side i'll have a large slider in the front you know kind of kind of like a maybe eight by eight foot or somewhere in there it might be a little bit shorter maybe seven and a half foot tall but somewhere in that range by about eight foot wide we got 10 foot ceiling heights in this barn i kind of went back and forth whether i want to do eight foot or ten foot i mean i really wanted ten foot i just like that extra height and it was minimal expense to go <clears throat> the extra height. I thought when I was reading up on it, uh, someone had a figure that it was maybe 5% more. I don't know if that's actually what it worked out to be, but I just like what the extra height brings, you know. I think it just looks better when you walk into the barn. It's a little bit bigger. And even just moving stuff around in there, you know. I mean, 8-foot ceiling, it seems like if you're moving around anything well, of any length, you know, you're hitting the ceiling and stuff like that. So it's just nice having the, the extra length. And this will be, this will be for our farm animals. We got three goats and at the timer of the recording, we only have 19 chickens, but we started out with 24. I think we got a couple of roosters. So we ended up giving those two away and then one got sick and we lost one to one to a dog and I think we lost one to a hawk, so we're down to 19 chickens at the time of the recording. But, yeah, because you get the chickens, you know, you, you expect they're all going to be hens, but every once in a while you get some roosters in the mix. So we end up uh, giving, giving one away earlier on and then held on to one for a little while and then end up giving that one to a friend as well. So, yep, we got the first row of the sheathing done. Um, Amy just helped me line it up nice and good. I think I'm just going back and I just tacked it in with I just tacked it in with some some nails to hold it in place. Then I'm going back with the nailer and putting it in. Yeah, that scaffolding came in pretty pretty helpful. It's just a pain sliding it around on the lawn, especially if the lawn gets a little bit a little bit soft in the spring with the rain and stuff. But yeah, the scaffolding was was nice. It made the first row super easy. The time lapse going, it doesn't make it seem like the second row is too bad, but the second row was kind of a pain. She had to kind of position it perfect right there, and then give it a nice little push up, and then bring it down slowly to get into the clips. You know, the spacer clips that lock it with the bottom row. Oh, there's Amy back. I don't I don't think she ends up coming back up there. I think she just watches while I'm doing the second row. She doesn't want to get that high up on the on the scaffolding. But she'll help me she'll help me a ton putting pieces up there, carrying pieces and stuff like that. But when it gets up that high, you know, just like, do it on your own or 
pick up the phone and give give somebody a call. But I'm pretty stubborn when it comes to that. I'd rather figure it out on my own and just muscle it out on my own. I mean, part of it is this is my first barn build. I mean, I've done some other random little projects, you know, with my dad and stuff like that. Putting up a wall in the house or, you know, boarding up a, a doorway or something, you know, taking a door out, putting a, putting the wall in that doorway or <clears throat> taking a taking a wall down, you know, putting a new kitchen in, stuff like that. But, you know, nothing of nothing of this size, definitely not, nothing of a post frame style. Now with the third row on this, it's a partial sheet. It just seemed to be a lot easier just working from a ladder inside of the barn and reaching down. Because I just nailed in the the first row, I would nail all in off the scaffolding, and then half of the second row I would nail and then go up into the barn and just reach over. It wasn't too bad. But when you're by yourself, just a lot of up and down, in and out. You know, just want to make sure everything's lining up before you start throwing all the nails in there and making sure it's coming along good. <clears throat> But yeah, I mean, all in all, it went pretty well. Just just time consuming. I don't know if you can tell in the in the photo, but I'll actually talk. Well, actually, I don't think I talk more in this video. I think I did a separate video on it. But this, to some people, this OSB may be upside down, even though it doesn't technically matter which side is up or which side is down. But when you look at it, kind of the, I guess the, almost the shaded lines going down you know, the, the panel there on each row, you can kind of see it, but that's writing and it says this side down. And I did some reading on it before, before I put it up, just to kind of see what people's opinions were. Um, you know, a lot of people just put the colored stripe lines out. I mean, obviously that helps with nailing off to your rafters and stuff. I mean, those lines might be off a little bit, but it's a pretty good, <clears throat> pretty good gauge for when you're nailing stuff off. But yeah, I did some reading on it and I knew that the roof would be, ex since I was doing it by myself, I knew the roof would be exposed to some weather a decent amount. So I came across a forum and people were commenting on it and they said do the, so the one side of the OSB is like a coarse, uh, I guess a coarse rough texture. So when it's, so when that side's up and it's on a roof, you know, that makes sense because you, you can walk on it and it gives you traction. So one side's kind of coarse and gives you traction on it and then the other side which is the side sticking out on my barn is the smooth side um so people that had been in the industry and done this for a while claim that the smooth side would repel water better you know the, the rough side was obviously rougher so it would be more prone to wanting to absorb water and the smooth side the water would wick off better so I, I opted to go smooth side out because this is a gambrel style barn. I knew I wouldn't be walking on the first pitch angle, which is a 24, 12 pitch. I said, well, I'm not really walking on much of this roof. The only part I'm walking on will be the 412 pitch on the top. And I said, you know what, I'll, I'll give it a try. So that's why I opted to go smooth side out, you know, like, anything else in every single industry, you're going to have people's opinions and what they think's right, what they think's wrong, you know, and I, I cleared it with the manufacturer. I reached out to Warehouser before I did it and just ran it by. I'm like, Hey, one side says this side down. Does that, how does that apply in a roofing application? And they said, it really doesn't matter which side goes up or which side goes down. We just put that on the, you know, on the smooth side. Um, you know, so, Typically in roofing applications, people would put that side down, but so the rough side's up to walk on, but he said, you know, I mean, structurally speaking, it doesn't matter which way you do it, according to the warehouser um, individual I talked to on the phone. Because I was just curious, you know, people were going back and forth. It's like, well, why don't I just ask the manufacturer what they think? And they said it structurally does not matter. It's preference of, it's, you know, it's your preference. But from a safety perspective, I could see, 
you know, if you do roofing all the time and that's what you do day in and day out, I would think obviously traction would be the safe way to go on it. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'll do it again. I mean, you can see the barn in front of this one. That's actually going to be my second barn project. That was a old horse barn on the property that back part with the two windows and kind of the chicken run there. That's where the horses used to be. That's roughly a 20 by 20. And then they did an addition onto the front for a hay storage and stuff like that. But it's pretty dilapidated. I think the back barn was probably built similar to the house around 1940. And then they did an addition, uh, 1954, I think. So it's, the roof needed to be replaced on it 20 years ago. There's been so much water damage coming into it that, you know, just pricing out, pretty much rebuilding it or, you know, starting all over from a fresh plate, you know, demoing it and redoing it almost seems like the better way to go. Otherwise I'm probably going to have to put my hands on literally almost every single piece of wood in that thing to, to redo it. So when the roof went, it just created leaks in the ceiling and water was running down inside. So you got roof sheathing that's rotted out. That's why I got the tarp on there to at least make it watertight. You know, after I bought the house, figured I'd throw a tarp on there so I could at least use the barn a little bit for storage. And it works fine for the for the animals right now. We just put them in the old horse stall, uh, the three goats, and then I built out a chicken coop inside for the chickens and then just kind of that makeshift chicken run uh, we got from somebody. So that'll work for now until this animal barn gets done and I can outfit it for the goats and the chickens and do a chicken run and stuff like that. <clears throat> but that'll be the second barn project. So I'll, you know, make my way through this one and learn a lot on this one. Like anything, the first time you do it, it seems to take a long time just doing research and working on it. But I learned, you know, I knew what pole barns were and what post frames were, but I hadn't really given them too much thought, you know, most people just do, at least in the area I'm in, you know, most people just do a stick built garage. Um, you know, I'm kind of more in a city setting, even though we're in a unique area that we have a decent amount of land where we're at, you know, one, 1 1.6 acres. And there's some properties around us that are like this, but you know, you can even see the houses over there. That's a subdivision that, I mean, they have decent sized lots over there too, you know, half acre or something around a half acre or maybe a hair more, but I think they're more half acre. Uh, you know, they, they border our property, but we're in a unique area where our zoning allows this type of stuff. And we have, we have a lot of land for where we're at. Oh, so here I am on the second side, throwing up the sheathing. It's a nice day out. You know, with all the kids' activities and stuff going on, you got to take advantage of these nice days between the kids' sports and rainy days in the springtime. It can be tough working on this stuff. So when you get time, you just got to go at it and get, much, get as much done as you can. But, I mean, that's the thing with this project, you know, working, working solo a lot. You just got to keep persevering, keep working through it. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, I, I knew what pole barns and post frames were, but I hadn't really given them too much thought. So that's where we got, the, you know, bought this property or bought this house with the property and stuff. Uh, and then I started doing some, some research and stuff like that and kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. And I came across, I came across a guy on the internet and YouTube who does all he does is post frames. So I was able to learn a lot about post frames and kind of the benefits the post frame construction and stuff like that uh, from RR buildings. I mean, he's been doing, he's obviously been doing it for a while, but he's been doing videos and YouTube for quite some time now as well. But yes, yeah, so he's a wealth of knowledge when it, <clears throat> when it comes to this stuff, you know, from the framing, uh, he does more of a, well, he does gable style roofs, So he doesn't do the gambrel roofs, at least none of the videos I've ever seen. Maybe he's done them before, but that doesn't seem to be his go-to. Let's do this. 
throw it up here real quick and I'll grab it. Yeah, as I was saying there before the before I started talking there in the video while we were loading up the sheathing there on the loft to get prepared for the top roof pitch. Uh, yeah, Kyle over at RR Buildings, he's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to laying out post frames. I mean, he has massive buildings, you know, like 80 by 100, you know, just big old buildings and stuff. But just all the layout all the way up to, you know, laying the whole thing out, putting the post in the ground, throwing all your girts up, um, putting all your trusses on. And all the all the steel work that he does does the steel sidewall, steel roof and stuff, how to do all that, how to do all your trim and stuff. He just has tons of good content over there. So he he kinda made it easy you know, and doing research and learning about post frames. Um I just I just love the option that post frame gives you. You know, you can your posts are obviously your foundation, but then you can go back and you got an idea of where you want your windows or where you want your doorways and stuff like that. But if you want to change something along the way, you, you can, you can move a window from, you know, over four foot or take a doorway and move it or add a doorway at the back of the building while you still have your doorway in the front of the building. You know, as long as you're working within your posts, you have so much freedom. Uh, you don't have to worry about any, you know, headers over your doorways or over your windows and stuff like that. Cause the posts are structurally holding up the building. So I mean, that's what I like about the post frame. Um, and this being an animal bar, and I'm going to have a dirt floor in it, so post just seemed to be the way to go with this. Instead of a stick frame, you know, usually you usually have a cement floor and stuff like that that you do your stick framing on. So post frame was the, was the way to go, and, you know, that's why I went with it. I love the versatility with it, and, yeah, just the options you have with it, and I just kind of like the overall look of them as well. So here I am working on the roof, the top roof part here. It's a little bit of a, I think I'm about to wrap up here. All right, here we are back the next day. It's a little bit of pain getting the pieces up there. You'll see me kind of muscle up the eight foot pieces. Just kind of, kind of bounce them up there in your hand and get them to flop down on the roof up there. Just kind of, you just, just figure it out as you go, you know, how to, how to get it done, what works. And after you throw one or two pieces up there, you kind of learn, you go from there, just figure out what's the, what's the easiest way to do it. But yeah, you can really see the, the clear span openness on this, on this barn, you know, it's 20 foot wide. And although you don't have, uh, you know, you don't have ceiling height, like head, I guess, head, headroom the whole way from side to side. I think maybe about what was it? It was twelve or fourteen foot. You have you have headroom from side to side, easily twelve foot, and maybe and then it starts dropping down a little bit. You know there maybe maybe I think I have uh, twelve foot width. I can walk. You know about six foot. I can walk um, along the the side wall. Uh, six foot either way off center, twelve foot total. But you know you can order. So obviously I, I hand built these Gambro rafters. <clears throat> you can see all the gusset plates there, three quarter inch uh, plywood on either side, nailed off, four inch on center, and at all the intersections. So I got two, four, six gusset plates per per rafter. These are two by twelve uh, rafters. I just love the openness. Uh, you you can buy these rafters. Uh, 
you know, Gambrel rafters or Gambrel trusses, I guess you call them, that are manufactured. And they come with interior webbing. So where this pitch angle changes coming up the sidewall from the 24-12 pitch to the 4-12 pitch, right in there around that intersection, you'd have a 2 by 4 coming down to the floor that they call like interior webbing. And then from roughly that intersection over to the other intersection, you know, about seven or eight foot up, you would have a horizontal two by four. And then you'd have another two by four, you know, coming down to the other side, another vertical two by four. So you'd have two by fours that were about 12 foot apart. Up here I come talking some more. Oh, I'm just finishing up my girts up on the back of the barn up top. And then in between the girt that I'm nailing off and the one below it, you can see on either side, I kind of have these, I have these spacers there. Those work well when I'm by myself because that's the exact spacing I, I need between my two foot on center girts. So I just pre-cut those spacers and I can lay them in there and just lay the girt on top of that and it just makes for quick and precise installation when I'm by myself. Yep, just took the one out there on the right. I'll probably take the other one out on the left. And you can see this barn is built on a little bit of a, a little bit of a hill. I'm gonna have to backfill it with a decent amount of sand. I knew that going into it. This is where we wanted to place the barn on the property, and I just factored that into it. It's just funny on the back side of the barn here where I'm kind of hanging up there on the girts, it just seems so much higher up in the air because the ground's a little bit lower, you know, from the from the grade board. You know, you got a couple feet there and then it's just kind of a, a sloping hill as it goes towards my backyard down to a ditch and then it starts going back up. But it just gives you a sense that you're so much higher up in the air. <laughs> up here in the front doesn't seem as bad. You feel kind of contained with the the other barn behind you and you know the front of the barns the front of the barns flush with the ground up here so it doesn't seem as bad Again. 
already said I was curious if he does it again. I was like, I never had to do that. You gonna lock him up? As I was saying about the clear spanned uh, opening, you know, here in this Gambrel, Gambrel rafters, although I don't have the headroom from side to side, you know, from edge to edge, you know, just kind of more in the center area. I mean, you can see me when I walk back and forth, you know, I, I cover quite a, quite a bit, you know, of headroom walking side to side, but the bottom part, I mean, I'll still utilize that for hay storage you know, for our goats and stuff or other miscellaneous stuff, I can lay down, you know, low down in the, down to the floor on the edges. So yeah, it would have been a lot easier and a lot quicker just to buy the pre-manufactured trusses, but I didn't want to have a box that I was confined to, you know, a 12 foot wide by seven or eight foot tall box. <clears throat> you know, you can always go and add some floor you know some plywood flooring over on the sides on the outside of the webbing you know you have a what you know you have a couple feet on either side maybe four foot on either side of the of the webbing where you could add some other plywood but then you're still working between your vertical two by four upright webbings every two foot and you're just kind of restricted on what you can get into that area and it'd just be a pain in the butt it was well worth it to me and time and just number one the look that came out to having the open clear span look i mean whenever i think of a gambrel barn you ever go inside one of those and it's just all nice and open and clean and it looks very sharp and now i'm finishing up uh, nailing off the roof sheathing on the top pitch and then i'll be moving along to the yep moving along to the underlayment This is a synthetic underlayment. I opted to use it just as a, an additional barrier, you know, after your steel roofing and stuff up there, I figured why not, you know, it's not really that expensive. I might as well just put it up and just have an extra layer of defense between my roof sheathing and the, and the steel. Got one of the little guys coming up. They all like to hang out and climb up on the scaffolding. Uh, get a little sun tanning going on there. Taking a taking a rest, laying down, back up. <laughs> yeah, they have fun working on the barn. I and mean, they can't always help me on some of the high up tasks and stuff, or moving wood around up high on the scaffolding and stuff like that. But well, guys, with, so as you can see, I decided stuff. to pull off the first layer of roofing underlayment I had on both sides of the barn. Um, I noticed it as I was working, uh, going across and got to the end that the one side was off an eighth of an inch and this side was off three sixteenths of an inch. So I wasn't too happy with that. I was kind of aiming for perfection. So 
I decided to tear it off. We're going to redo it and get as close to perfection as possible. But no, that's not why I tore it off. Even if it was off an eighth of an inch to three sixteenths of an inch, I'd you know maybe adjust the next the next layer and uh, go from there. But it wouldn't be a big deal as long as you had proper coverage. But no, that's not why I tore it off. Uh, the manufacturer calls for plastic cap nails on this synthetic membrane. Um, but after I got the first layer up on both sides, I was kind of looking at it and I was concerned that these plastic cap nails, which is essentially a plastic washer with a nail through it that's used to hold down the membrane, it gives good holding power, you know, in the event that maybe you have a bad windstorm or if there's a time period in between putting your uh, actual roof on, whether it's the shingles, the metal roofing i'm doing metal so since i'm doing metal i opted to take the plastic cap nails out and i'm going to put it all back on with a slap stapler with the staples that'll sit flush with the osb and not sit proud of it because i was concerned that when i put my metal roofing on and i have all these plastic washers scattered all throughout the roof that those would show through as you're pulling the metal with the screws flush to the osb you'd have this nipple effect all throughout the roof uh, almost like an oil can appearance or a wavy appearance. And I didn't want to take that risk of, you know, looking at that for the next, uh, whatever, how long this, you know, next several years, it wasn't really worth it. So I opted to spend an hour, hour and a half and tear them all out with a hammer and a crowbar. And I'm gonna go ahead and start over and use a slap stapler. But I'm sure that the speed of the slap stapler, uh, I'll definitely recoup my time and probably finish sooner or about the same time had I been, you know, pounded in all these plastic cap nails, even though I had to kind of step back and tear some off and then I'll go, now go forward and redo it, you know, but I don't want to take that risk. So I opted to tear it off and start over. So let's get back at it. Sometimes you, uh, you know, like anything you do, especially for the first time, you just live and learn, you know, I mean, obviously the next barn will be more streamlined and, you know, I, I will have my approaches more dialed in and stuff like that. There's none of there's a, you don't have that learning curve, you know, going through it, but obviously that's part of taking on these projects and part of what makes it so gratifying and rewarding in the end that like, yeah, it's not always straightforward. It's not always easy. I mean, that's just like one little aspect of, you know, a little difficulty or a little headache that you run into along the way, you know? You know, sometimes you envision stuff on paper and then <clears throat> when you actually try to put it to application, you know, when you're constructing your building, like sometimes things don't come together the way you thought they would. And, you know, sometimes things come to better, come together better than you thought they would, you know, it's just part of building and just being able to stand back and look at your progress and tasks that you can complete every single day, you know. And just look at the overall picture i mean look here i got my got the full structure uh pretty much up almost mostly uh watertight at this point you know got all my posts up all my girts up i got all my rafters built i got all my roof sheathing on i'm starting my underlayment you know this underlayment won't make it necessarily perfectly watertight but it'll greatly reduce the amount of water that gets into the barn and stuff like that but that was kind of the reason why I did the smooth side up on the, on the OSB, um, you know, based on one person's perspective, they thought it, uh, wick water away better than the other side. You know, maybe there's some truth to that or maybe there's not, but at the end of the day, it doesn't, it doesn't structurally affect the, the building. So I'm not, I'm not worried about giving it a try. Got my little guy up there on the second level of the scaffolding. Shouldn't say my little guy. He's, uh, he's not the littlest guy we got. Um, yeah, he's up there helping me with the, with the underlayment. The first time I tried unrolling it as I went, and that was kind of a pain, you know, like a 412 pitch, you can just lay it down and kind of give it a roll and roll to the other end of the roof and just hit it with a stapler as you go here on the 2412 pitch. It was not quite as easy. So I just measured out and laid out the pieces about. 32 probably a little extra about 33 foot long you know it's only a 32 foot roof 30 foot building so i got a 30 foot building with the foot overhang on each side so 32 foot so i just rolled them out and cut them a little little extra and put them up there but yeah i was not willing to risk putting 
uh, my steel roofing down, just having that oil can appearance all throughout, I would not have been pleased with it. So that's why I opted to pull them all out and uh, go with the slap stapler. Got a little bit of an audience. There's the, there's the littlest guy running around, moving all the wood around, running around. Got a chicken out there, another kid out there. But it's always fun, you know, when the, when the family can help out. Yeah, me and my wife, Amy, we, yeah, did this did this together to uh, to this point, you know, on the available evenings we have around the kids' activities. But we enjoy it. She's a, she's a hard worker, tough worker, so it's always fun working with her. Where's she on the, I was looking where she's at in the scaffolding. She's on the, <laughs> on the first row. Still high up, you know, I don't know, whatever that is, six foot up or so. <laughs> but it's a quite a sense of accomplishment when you get each major stage done. You know, you get all the rafters up there. It's like, oh, wow, you know, that was that was nice. And it's like, all right, now I got to put all the roof sheeting up there. Like, oh, boy, all right, let's do all that. Put all the roof sheeting up there. And it's like, all right, we got that done. Now we got to put the underlayment up there. Oh, apparently we got... Apparently we got a little bit of rain coming down or some light snow. Here's a little bit of rain coming down. Contemplated what I was going to do there for a second. Said, no, I got to get as much done as I can. I'm just going to wait it out for a minute. And now I'm cutting open where my ridge vent will breathe. Getting that all prepped. And then I'll just overlap the underlayment, you know, oh, lay it over the one side and take the other side and overlap it. And then when it comes time to put my roof steel on, I'll just cut that part out with the, with a Stanley knife and expose it. <laughs> 